this week on the Back Table Podcast. Our hope is, is as you, you may know, like in block resection or trying to remove tumors that are appropriate in one piece, or at least in one piece to be subdivided later, is actually showing great promise in Asia and Europe as a better mechanism of staging. And I'll use you know, the idea that a lot of those studies have shown staging accuracy upward over 90%, where again, in the United States, using standard loop resection, there's at least a lot of data suggests that you know, we're giving the pathologist what I like to call a cauterized slurry of small pieces of tissue that is not oriented, is not spatially apparent to them, and they're sort of just searching through it, hoping to see, well, hoping not to see tumor cells adjacent to muscle cells. Whereas being able to remove something in block, I think will open up all sorts of opportunities for better therapy. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Backtable Urology Podcast, your source for all things urology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and at backtable.com. The Jose Silva is your host this week. I'm happy to introduce our guest, Dr. Duke Harrell. Dr. Harrell went to medical school at University of Virginia School of Medicine, followed by a residency at University of Virginia Medical Center. Later went on to do a fellowship in minimally invasive urologic surgery from Loyola University Medical Center. Currently, he's a professor at Vanderbilt University, a director of minimally invasive urologic surgery program, and former division chief of endurology and stone disease. Furthermore, Dr. Harrell helped found the Vanderbilt Institute for Surgery and Engineering, which combines surgeons and engineers to create a medical device and new technology. And that's not all. Furthermore, for the purpose of this episode, he's the Chief Executive Officer and Chief Medical Officer at Virtuoso Surgical. Duke, welcome to Backtable. Thank you, Jose, and thank you to all your listeners. Duke, so about two years ago, back at the Southeastern section in Puerto Rico, I heard you talking about the virtuoso, the device, the robot, and today we're going to talk about that. So for the listeners, can you go back and, and give us a little bit of a background, a little bit in the intro? Sure. You know, and I could go way far back, but I'll go back to uh, 2001. I got recruited to Vanderbilt after several jobs. And uh, when I got there, I found myself falling in with several engineers that were doing really great work. I, I'm not an engineer by background, but I've always been sort of a better mousetrap kind of person. I did an early laparoscopy fellowship when no one knew what to do with it. And so I was kind of on the front end of minimally invasive surgery. Once I'd been there a couple of years, we had some uh, grants and other things that developed. And I started working with a uh, very brilliant mechanical engineer by the name of Bob Webster. And Bob had developed this very unique idea when he was at Johns Hopkins, which is the basis of these concentric tube robots that are the underlying technology of Virtuoso Surgical. What these are basically are tubes of nitinol metal. It's a special super elastic metal. We form them into curves, and these curves can both be decurved and then curve again because of the super elastic properties of the metal, such that when you put one inside the other and then translate and rotate them, you can actually create a tentacle-like motion. And these can be very, very, very small, such that the scale of these we're working at right now is to have one millimeter instruments, which is far smaller than anything that has so far been used in the robotic realm in terms of clinical application. And so after several years of exploring these in the lab, we realized that, and we took these around to several major strategics at the time, we realized that the era of many strategics developing technology in-house had sort of ended and that the expectation was that we were going to develop this as a startup company and get it de-risked to a certain point before it would even be an option for a strategic or anyone to uh, look at acquiring it or, or doing anything with it. And so that was the impetus for Virtuoso Surgical. Myself and three co-founders started the company in 2016. We were lucky enough to get some early federal grant money through a program called the SBIR program, Small Business Innovation Research Program, and that let us open the doors and uh, we're off to the races, so to speak. We've continued that development over the last six plus years and uh, now we're here and I can fill you in more in a second, but uh, that's sort of the background of how we got at least to the formation of Virtual Surgical. So you are a urologist. At what point do you say, hey, I, I want to do more? I'm just going to treat patients. Uh, I want to do, go into inventing stuff, go into that part of the entrepreneurship. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I it was sort of a natural progression. As I said, we we had these grants and I started getting, I mean, I got my first RL1 as a co-PI when I was in my late 40s, which is unusual. Most people get them when they're in their 20s or 30s. But for surgeons especially, I think we have for us to develop the skill set and to understand what the needs are within the field, I think sometimes takes us a while to develop our craft, as I like to say to residents and fellows, before we can really understand the challenges and perhaps the solutions. And so it was a progression as we took these things into the lab and developed them, we realized that things in the lab are great, but you really want to get those things to patients. And that became our mission starting in 2016. And, and I just sort of naturally flowed into that as time went on, took the job of initially chief medical officer, and then around a year and a half ago, was asked to serve as interim CEO, and then more recently as CEO. When you went to Vanderbilt, did you visual yourself progressing to something else rather than just being just a, a urologist? You know, hard to say. I mean, I've always enjoyed the research element and, and working with the brilliant engineers and PhD students and everyone. I, I tell my family, it keeps me young you know, to, to be around all these brilliant young people and to really put challenges in front of them of what we need to improve patient care and, and help in that process. And so I don't know that I came into it thinking I was going to be an entrepreneur, but once I realized what needed to be done, I think like most of us who are surgeons, we're, we, we tend to be go-getters and we tend to like to learn new things and take on new challenges. And so I think it was a bit of a natural progression to do that. And right now, are you still seeing patients? Yeah, I'm uh, fortunate. I've got a very supportive department at Vanderbilt. And so during this period, I was able to take a six-month sabbatical that allowed me to really concentrate uh, on the company around a year ago. And then I'm back to sort of a uh, partial clinical load at this point. And again, still have some grants and some other work. So in essence, I divide my time between the two things. And luckily for me, uh, Virtuoso sprang out of Vanderbilt University and Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And so in many ways, what I like to say is I believe that incentives are aligned because we've licensed our intellectual property out of Vanderbilt's Tech Transfer Center and a various other sources. And so Vanderbilt is involved in the company. They don't have any board seats or control, but they've certainly been a great partner through all this. And as a matter of fact, have recently formed an investment arm that is looking at, and we're one of the first startup companies that they've invested in out of the university. And how does that work? Being in a, in a big uh, health system, you have an idea. How do you compete with them or what do you need to do that the intellectual property is yours and not of the health system? Well, I mean, for most of us in academia, it's automatically belongs to the health system or the academic institution. And certainly a lot of our IP does. So I'm an inventor on several of the major patents that have been granted on to Virtuoso. And so what happens there is once you, and again, you should always patent and protect things. You know, certainly what I tell people is if you're in an academic institution or an institution where you're utilizing that to create, you automatically most times have negotiated to let them have that intellectual property. I will state that most centers now, and especially academic centers, are very interested in entrepreneurship and really pushing it forward. And so there are mechanisms to go in and, and in essence, license that intellectual property. And so once we made the decision to form the startup and, and got the first grants, we had a process where we actually, through our lawyers, negotiated to a license to the technology out of Vanderbilt. And so, you know, that's part of this process. And then once you have a company, typically depending on who's doing the inventing, we now have patents that are being granted to the company itself because a lot of the current intellectual property is being developed by the engineers and employees of the company directly. And so we have a combined patent portfolio that consists of things that are licensed out of several universities. Actually, Johns Hopkins was the original patent holder that we have a uh, license to the base technology that is concentric tubes. And then we have several granted patents through Vanderbilt that we feel are very protective of the technology. We have our first patent that's been granted to Virtuoso recently. And then like any good technology, you also have things that you may not want to patent and those are called trade secrets. And so part of this is patents are always public after a defined time limit. And so if you're doing some things to create something that is taking you a lot of time and energy to figure out and will take someone else a lot of time and energy, it's sometimes a good idea to not patent those things if you don't want to have that out in the public realm. And 
You mentioned the, the lawyer's part. I mean, at that moment, were you putting money out of your pocket to pay for your lawyers versus the institution? Yeah, I mean, you know, certainly the institution wants, and, and Vanderbilt, I think, is very forward thinking about this. They want people to do startups. They know what comes with this is not only, you know, reputational gain for being the place that uh, hopefully created a new technology that could impact medicine and the medical field, as well as the potential financial gain that may come along with, you know, most of the time you've negotiated, there's some baseline licensure deals that usually involve a royalty as well as a small amount of equity in the company and some other things that protect their intellectual property rights when you license it out. And can you walk us through once you have the idea, I know it's not going to be simple to explain it, but what are the fundamental steps that you need to take afterwards to make it a reality? That's an interesting question and one that I'll, uh, I'll take a stab at, uh, you know. I won't say I, we got it right until we succeed, but, you know, I think there, there's lots of great ideas and there's lots of great research that goes on in academia. I think there's sometimes the realization that what has been invented or what has been created has great potential. And along the way, as I said, we realized that without us throwing in behind this and really putting our shoulders to the wagon, so to speak, this was not going to get done. You know, the, the big companies needed it de-risked. If they were going to entertain doing it, we knew that the vast majority of current products now are created by startups. And so, you know, it's a bit of the realization that this is a valuable technology, not only financially, but also for patients, that there's a market for it, you know, and then there's this critical step, I think, of finding the right people. You know, again, I've been blessed to have Bob Webster as my partner, both in the grant world, as well as in the company world over the past 12 plus years. And, and Bob is truly a genius. I mean, you know, he uh, has created uh, things that I think are going to really revolutionize the fields of, of multiple areas of surgery. And then you need to find someone because most of us in academia have a full-time job. You need to find people that are going to be dedicated to creating this. And we were lucky enough in this process to have a young engineer who had come in to do his PhD in Bob's and my lab with us, Rich Hendrick. As Rich likes to say, he met us on the first day. We had this idea of what we wanted to do with these concentric tubes and put them through an endoscope and start utilizing them as really the smallest tools available to do dexterous manipulation. And so he started working on that day one, did his PhD with us over about a four to five year period, and then agreed to stay on and take over as our COO of the company. He's really the lead engineer and the CEO. He's one of our co-founders. So you've got myself, Bob Webster, Rich Hendrick as our COO and really lead engineer. And then we were also lucky enough, I have a good friend who I met through social circles, who's a lawyer, who's got a lot of experience in business and the finance world and the startup world, who for a variety of reasons was available and interested in joining with us. And he's served as our CAO and really our internal general counsel. And I also can't credit that enough. I mean, to, to tell you that, you know, having that kind of availability has uh, been a great adjunct to our development of the company, both on the business side as well as on the legal side. And in terms of the health system, you mentioned you, you've been partnered with, with Vanderbilt, they will be supporting you all this time. That initial funding or, or, or how do you get money? Because one thing is an idea, another thing is do, doing everything else. Yeah. So again, we, as you asked, I mean, yes, there was some initial capital outlay on, on my part and several of the founders' parts. You know, some of the people that just finished PhDs don't necessarily have any money. And so, you know, there was a small outlay of money to get us started. But really the money that I like to say opened the doors and allowed us to get space off campus and really, you know, create a functional company was in the form of those initial SBIR grants. And that mechanism, you know, that there's two types of these grants. There's SBIR and STTR. They really are, to credit the U.S. government, the way in which many technologies are supported and incubated and launched out of research labs these days. And so, you know, it, it's in essence a great way to, if you can, get that initial money. Many people do it via the venture capital world. We were lucky enough to get our initial launching money through these grant mechanisms and then we've actually created our funding for the company a little bit differently than most medical device companies. Most of the companies out there, as you may know, take a venture round, uh, an initial sort of seed round. We did the initial friends and family equity raise that we did through 
a very interesting mechanism. Again, having an in-house lawyer and, and business person allowed us to realize that there was a new mechanism, a relatively new mechanism created by the federal government called Regulation A+. The Regulation A+, Plus is a SEC qualified mechanism that allows public investors to invest in a qualified company. So basically you apply to the SEC, you have to do a GAAP, good accounting principle financials for two years. You have to design your investment vehicle in a way that the SEC feels is appropriate for investors in terms of all the warnings and the disclosures and all those things. But it actually allowed us to sell stock equity to investors early on. And so we've done that several times. We've also been continuously very successful in getting other grants along the way. And so, you know, right now we've raised around $15 million total. We have runway as of present. We have continued development. We're now way beyond prototype phase. We've actually crossed over what's called design freeze, which means where you've said, this is what our product is going to look like and be like. And now we're in what's called verification and validation testing. There's a variety of standards that you have to meet in terms of safety and a variety of other things, electronics, software, shipping, uh, sterilization, all of these things that are very complicated. You know, people within the company have had to become experts on this. We also employ a good number of consultants and outside firms to do this. And so this is a you know, an ongoing process. It's not just creating the uh, prototypes, it's actually then creating the product and along the way also getting input from clinicians, which we continue to do on a regular basis. The next step will be animal testing after once you get the the quality and everything. So we're, we're into verification and validation now. We've already done some animal testing. We've done some work in cadavers as well as part of several grants that we've had We've actually had grants not only in, in BPH for prostate removal of tissue, but we've also had some grants in what's called central airway obstruction or tracheal obstruction removal. This device, because we're taking, in essence, a rigid scope and bringing two one millimeter dexterous tools through this that can interact and they can carry lasers, graspers, snares, a variety of tools, it really holds the promise, I think, to revolutionize all of rigid endoscopy. And so anywhere rigid endoscopes are used, there could be the potential that the Virtuoso platform could be of benefit. Now, that'll need to be proven over time. Our first work is in urology, aimed directly at prostate BPH tissue removal. Uh, uh, I like to call it sort of similar to a nucleation. We will likely use laser energy, although we also have bipolar and, and other types of energy available to us. The other thing that people I think are excited about, and I think I probably showed when you saw it, is to improve TURBT or bladder lesion removal and sampling. I think there's those those of us in the urologic world realize that that is not a great oncologic operation. You know, we we oftentimes, at least in the studies in the literature, someone out there does not obtain good staging information in the form of muscle. I've never met, a, never met a urologist who said they didn't do a good TURBT, but somehow in the literature, 50% of the time, specimens don't have muscle. And it certainly is not possible for people to get things like margin determination. And I think really there's a, there's a great opportunity here to provide not only better staging, but perhaps new ways of intervening on these patients. And there's a lot of excitement, I think, in, in the bladder cancer community as well. No, I remember, I mean, thinking when I was a resident, every time that they, that somebody calls for a bladder rupture, say, can we do something endoscopically just through the urethra and just close it and, and get over with? And so then you'd have to deal with, with anything in the abdomen part. So when I saw your video of actually doing the, the cutting around the bladder tumor, I think, well, yeah, then there, there it is. Our hope is, is as you, you may know, like in block resection or trying to remove tumors that are appropriate in one piece, or at least in one piece to be subdivided later is actually showing great promise in Asia and Europe as a better mechanism of staging. And I'll use, you know, the idea that a lot of those studies have shown staging accuracy upward over 90%, where again, in the United States using standard loop resection, there's at least a lot of data suggests that, you know, we're giving the pathologist what I like to call a cauterized slurry of small pieces of tissue that is not oriented, is not spatially apparent to them, and they're sort of just searching through it, hoping to see, well, hoping not to see tumor cells adjacent to muscle cells. 
Whereas being able to remove something in block, I think will open up all sorts of opportunities for better therapy, perhaps the avoidance of re-resection, which as you know, is part of the guidelines from the AUA for many bladder cancers. And I think there's a lot of people excited about the idea of some of the therapeutics that could be available if one were able to do perhaps a margin negative resection of a bladder tumor in the future. And so again, I don't, I tend to be one of these people who's looking way down the road. I don't want to say that that's going to be possible, but I think it would be very exciting in the cancer world, especially with things like some of the bladder sparing work that's going on these days. It's, it's probably how, I mean, how it's going to be. Like you mentioned, the bladder sparing already in Europe, a lot of, depending on the location, you can do bladder sparing and the patient will keep the function. So very excited to see that in the future. Going back to the grants, why will someone go to private funding if the government can give you money? Yeah, so the, the government is, you know, it A, we again are very blessed. So I Bob Webster is probably one of the best grant writers on the face of the earth, from what I know. You know, we we have been incredibly successful. Rich Hendrick also is a is a wonderful grant writer. And so I would say that we are a bit unusual in that we've been able to generate so much in terms of grant money early on. You know, it's also an exciting technology. And I think part of this is going back and and showing when you apply for grants in various areas that there's this opportunity. I mean, what the government and the, the wants is to see that there's the potential to improve care and with that potentially improve the economics of healthcare. And one can imagine that if you could do better and quicker removal of prostate tissue such that patients didn't have to have secondary procedures. If you could remove bladder tumors in blocks such that patients went on to the correct therapy faster during their care pathway, these have not only incredible opportunity to help the patients, but also incredible opportunity for economics of healthcare. You know, if someone is, you know, realized that they have a muscle invasive disease earlier in that care, it may be that you wind up saving money versus expensive chemotherapeutics and other things that are required down the road. You know, the vast majority of people do go for private funding. Private funding in medical device has really been difficult to get over the last several years. There are still some active funds out there. We've talked to a lot of VCs. And what I would say is that, you know, VC money is nice. It often comes with many things, including for some companies, a loss of control, as well as uh, for some companies, difficulty surviving when when they get too caught up in in those venture deals and so you know again i think venture money is great i uh, we are working right now with several venture funds who are very interested in investing you know we likely will at some point either take a strategic investment from a strategic company or a venture fund deal simply because the scale of money needed to do these kind of things is is really large and that's Probably one of the bigger realizations I've had during this is that we, we've been incredibly what I'll call capital efficient, meaning that people come in and, and they can't believe that we've done and created what we've done for the uh, amount of money that we have. But part of that is a testament to staying small, staying lean, and really staying focused. You know, and, and again, I'll just say in passing, I'll, I'll give credit where credit is due. The company that exhibits the biggest focus in this area, as you know, is Intuitive Surgical. And their relentless focus on one thing, which is robotic surgery, I think really is a lesson to all the companies out there that, you know, you need to remain focused, you need to remain capital efficient and push forward in what you need to accomplish. I think it's hard to be a large company that has so many different tentacles and and areas of interest and make robotics one of those, simply because robotics is a lot of work. And in terms of, of asking for more grants, you mentioned that you have gotten more grants. Do you have to change the focus, I guess, or, or that, that, the ro that your equipment can do something else? Or is it because you need more money? How, how do you ask for that? Yeah. And there's different ways to do this. So I'll use the example of there are different levels of these grants. There's what are called phase one and phase two. There's one called phase 2B, which is a uh, sort of a last level grant before you commercialize. So it's more of a commercialization grant aimed at not just development, but actually getting the product through human studies and approval. And then also, as you said, you can also change directions, right? So I'll use the example of we've had grants in prostate tissue removal, 
and then in central airway obstruction. And we just heard recently that we are likely, again, you never count a grant till you have the what's called notice of grant award, but we are likely to, to uh, be receiving a grant in bladder lesion removal as well. So again, different areas, trying to show advantages in those areas and the potential of the technology to change those areas. So similar to a to an R01 grant, but more aimed at commercialization and actually getting into patients. Yeah, there's also urethral diverticulose. So something else yeah, you can add to the repertoire, I guess. Yeah, no, it's, it's it, you know, I, I find this the funnest part of this is as we've, you know, people have heard me talking about this for several years. We've been very open. Uh, a lot of companies are very secretive about their technology, you know, because we have at this point over 65 physician investors on our capitalization table who've seen the technology, urologists, pulmonary people, neurosurgeons who've seen this and said, we, we want to help get this to patients, you know, and, and so they've invested in the company. But it's been really fun for me because when we show it, people just keep coming up with interesting things to do with it. And, and you know, I'll use the example of certainly, you know, early on we thought of BPH removal and bladder tumor removal. I think some of the really fascinating work that's being done on urethral reconstruction, I've had conversations with multiple reconstructive urologists about the idea of, you know, doing endoscopic buccal grafting, which I know some places are starting to do. They're using uh, some off-the-shelf tools that makes that, I think, really challenging. You know, our hope is that, you know, and again, we're not focused on suturing and all, but certainly with the kind of dexterity that we can bring to the field, the future is open to those kind of things. Melissa Kaufman, who uh, you may know, who's one of my partners at Vanderbilt, you know, tells me about every other week that she wishes she could have this to do some kind of mesh removal or other type of uh, transurethral or, or transvaginal surgery that she wishes to do. No, no, they, like I mentioned, the, the, the possibilities are, are, are endless. I was going to ask you something regarding the stages also going back to, to those grants so essentially, you go like phase one, the, the the idea, and then you move, continue to move forward, and you just see, you just r write the the grant, and and uh, hopefully you will get it, or if not, then just go for another route. Yeah, and and you know, and and like grant writing in the in the academic world, it's very similar. You know, you, you may get it the first time. We were very fortunate with some of our early grants. We actually uh, had amazing scores and got them right out of the gate. Several others we've resubmitted and been funded on. And then we've had some ones where we haven't been successful on and we continue to resubmit those. And again, you have to remember that, you know, this mechanism is also really wonderful, not only for the development, but also uh, for the investors, because this is non-dilutive capital. And so in essence, you know, we've raised at this point over $3 million in federal grant money along the way. And so it's a, it's a great mechanism. And you can imagine, you know, there's other programs out there having to do with uh, the states and how they're looking at developing industry within states and all where they do sometimes matching funds or some sort of percentage matching funds for these things. You know, which again, these are ways in which one can raise money that aren't the standard ways, but certainly in the, in the economic headwinds that have been going on the last few years, you know, all money is green. To me, it, however you can get it is, is a great way to get it. And was this device originally thought for urology or it just by talking to you it just evolved into something for urology yeah no i mean you know so concentric tubes were invented by bob webster and the original idea when he was at hopkins was the, to create them and and a lot of the early work was on the idea of using them as steerable needles so you know if you sharpen the end of it it's basically a needle it's a beveled needle and then you can in essence, make a, uh, a steerable needle. And so, you know, a lot of the work, and there continues to be work on this idea, you know, rather than having to take a straight linear pathway to get to somewhere, you can actually turn the needle and by spinning the tip or adjusting the angulation of the interaction of the tubes, you can direct it around obstacles. And so I remain fascinated by that. But, you know, what happened early on is that we were exploring all of that. We'd actually made a, in essence, a I was doing some micro laparoscopy with two millimeter instruments back then for suturing and reconstruction. And I was in the lab and Bob and, and several of his PhDs had created a, a unit that was in essence a micro laparoscopic robot. The arms were pretty far apart and we were sitting around and we looked at it and went, can we put those arms tight together and put them down a standard rigid endoscope? And that was kind of the impetus for what became Virtuoso. There's several 
things that happened along the way. One of the other avenues that we began to explore very quickly was neuroendoscopy. So I don't know if you know this, but the brain surgeons actually will, in, in certain circumstances, operate by putting a burr hole in the uh, skull, putting a rigid scope through the frontal lobe into the ventricles. And they remove things. There's uh, some benign and malignant lesions in there called colloid cysts and other pathologies that they like to remove with what is called neuroendoscopy. It's actually the ultimate test of why we need better tools because once you have a rigid scope through the brain, you really aren't allowed to tilt it. You know, as urologists, we can tilt the scope a lot and not damage structures. They can't tilt the scope very much because they push on the brain and that's not a good idea. And so we did actually in the beginning a lot of work in neuroendoscopy. We continue to have those conversations with a lot of different neurosurgeons who are very interested. Again, you know, I would say don't go to the brain as your first FDA approval and, and you know, but we certainly think that's also a potential avenue for down the road. And there's a lot of excitement for it as well. Yeah, and also for uh, pituitary tumors, ENTs going in. Yeah, you know, this the, the whole idea of, you know, taking this down to the scale that we're operating at, you know, with one millimeter instruments allows you to really operate in what I call these constrained environments. You know, as you said, the pituitary is a wonderful example as well. A lot of the neurosurgeons and ENTs are interested in that. Da Vinci can get to the base of the tongue with the SP, but once you get past that area, there are not really robotic platforms right now that are good for any sort of larger tissue removal or two-handed operations in the trachea and some of those areas. And so, you know, I'll use the example of, I, I talked about central airway obstruction. We have several uh, Mayo-trained pulmonary people at Vanderbilt that we've worked with on this, and we've done studies. One of the problems with the way they do rigid bronchoscopy right now for these airway obstructions, which happen at about 15 to 20 percent of patients with lung cancer, is these patients can't breathe, they're not oxygenating, they have to rush them to the OR, they tilt their head back, they have to, in essence, put a rigid scope down there, there's bleeding, there's a large tumor, they remove it, they have very, you know, similar to what we have, very rudimentary instruments. Oftentimes there's broken teeth, there's been cervical vertebrae injuries during these procedures because the patient is actively trying to die from hypoxia. And so we've actually looked at our system. When we put our system in, we reduce the forces on the neck by four times less than their manual approaches, and we speed up resection. You can imagine once a surgeon gets a second hand at the end of an endoscope, it really is a game changer. And when we talk to people out in the community, even we've done marketing analytics, the excitement around that and the realization as surgeons, right? You know, you and I both know there's always somebody who's going to say, well, I don't need that. I do it great the way it is. But, you know, none of us would operate with one hand if we had the opportunity to operate with two. Exactly. And Duke, in terms of the Vanderbilt Institute for Surgery Engineering, did this happen before Virtuoso? Was it after Virtuoso or? It preceded it. So, you know, I, again, I found myself in a lucky spot. When I came to Vanderbilt, there was a professor, Bob Galloway, who uh, had done a lot of work in image guidance. In the early world of neurosurgery, image guidance was stealth and brain lab and some of the systems that came out of some of that work. And Bob and I met while we were doing due diligence on acquiring our first robotic system. I was at Computer Motion and uh, Intuitive Surgical in 2003 with him. And Bob saw what I was doing and how interested I was in this, some of my ideas, and invited me to start going to his lab meetings. I would sneak over there and, and uh, participate. And out of that sprang sort of this loose coalition of about five or six of us who were doing really great work, I thought, in the engineering world. Several engineering professors across several disciplines, Bob Webster, Benoit DeWatt, who's currently the head of Vice. You know, and what happened was we realized we've got all this great work. We're generating grants. We're generating, you know, great intellectual property, but nobody knows about us. And so we were able to approach the dean of Vanderbilt, uh, the chancellor of Vanderbilt. And initially they did what you hope all academic institutions do is they realized they had something. They sprinkled some money on it. They put some really good people to help us and mentor us in the formation of that. We formed uh, initially what was uh, called an initiative, which means you don't control your own money. But eventually we actually went on to become a full institute. And we actually have thousands of square feet within the medical center with mock OR, development labs. We funded what we call a surgeon in residence program where several of us, including myself, it buys time 
to work on grants, to apply for your first research grants. I think our hit rate on that is well above 50% of people that do this wind up getting an R01. We've had it in multiple specialties. You know, in my in our department, Ryan C., who's a uh, just an astounding young force in, in stone disease, did the surgeon in residence program and has recently gotten some of his first grants. Nick Cavusi, who uh, did fellowship with us and then stayed on, similarly is starting to land his first grants in sort of using AI and a variety of uh, new imaging modalities. And so, and that's just in urology. We've had others within other surgical subspecialties. And so, again, lucky enough, be a right place, right time, helped us get formed, still sit on the steering committee. And, and again, you know, once you sort of start the flywheel going, it's amazing what comes out. So we now, Bob and I have the variety of, there's two startup companies, Virtuoso is one of them. The other one is one called Endothea that's developing some uh, really cool sort of micro machine material instruments. They're more designed for handheld use, but think of a steerable catheter that could aim a laser at the end of a, of a ureteroscope and applicable to a lot of flexible endoscopy. So you know, again, there's sort of this critical mass you get when you put the right people on the bus together. And we've been very fortunate. Vanderbilt's recruited astounding engineers over the years to the School of Engineering. The Medical Center has continued across a lot of disciplines to recruit really, really good people who are interested in pushing these ideas forward. So it's a great time to be at Vanderbilt. Last question. Is there still time to invest in your company or? <laughs> <laughs> we, we do actually. Uh, have it have the offering is still open you have to go to our website and you have to review the materials if our uh, gc was on he would tell me you know there's uh you have to read all of the uh disclaimers and all of the information there like any investment but yes there is and, and we currently have an offering open that people can invest in if they're interested so i direct them to the website excellent I'm gonna read it and duke anything else you want to add no, I just wanted to thank you. This is a great opportunity. I've been really looking forward to this. You know, one of the things we did early on was we decided that we wanted to have the opportunity for, you know, surgeons, urologists, other types of physicians to be part of this. You know, a lot of times we all get involved in things on the back end, so to speak. You know, the investment's been done, the company has spun up, you know, we, we might uh, get to be a little part of it or invest in it once it's gone public or something, but we really don't have the opportunity sometimes to get in early on these opportunities. And I think what you're seeing, which I think is really great, you know, the AUA is pushing forward. They did the Innovation Nexus this year. I don't know if you had a chance to get to that, but, you know, we got chosen as one of the top 10 companies that's predicted to impact urology. I think that's a great move by the AUA to sort of, you know, create the the desire within the specialty to see what's coming in the future and get us involved early. And so I, I look forward to sort of the next couple of years. I, I feel like I've been really blessed in my career. I got to do a lot of cool stuff and that continues and learn a lot of new interesting things. So thanks again, Jose. I really enjoyed this conversation. No, Duke, thanks for being here and definitely uh, I'm going to invest in your company, in, in, in you and your, your team, just like Vanderbilt did. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at underscore Backtable on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable is hosted by Aditya Bagrodia and Jose Silva. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross and Ness smith Savadoff, Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. With support from Devante Delbrun. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Administrative support provided by Jimmy Lee Kennebrew. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.